hear me or? All right. So um, they've got me uh, speaking first to sort of share with you a little bit of the research that I'm doing. And then from that, we're going to pivot into uh, uh, Bob Gray, a professor emeritus at Stanford, and we'll, uh, we'll keep the ball rolling. And so to uh, start with myself, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the research that our, we're doing in our group. And later on, you'll get more of a chance uh, to see some of our research when we give lab tours. And so uh, the path that our research group has gone uh, along that sort of integrates information and questions of neuroscience and beyond begins with uh, my graduate work when I was uh, working uh, under uh, Mural Medar that a lot of you know at MIT. Did my PhD work primarily in uh, electrical engineering, information theory, applied to wireless. I uh, got a faculty position lined up at University of Illinois. She told me not to go there right away, but rather to delay my start date and do a postdoc in something wildly different. And so that led to me uh, ending up doing a postdoc with the gentleman you see up top, uh, Emory Brown, who's an MD, PhD, pra practices medicine at Mass General, but also is a neuroscience researcher at MIT. And very interesting is his PhD is in statistics, so I had an opportunity to learn medicine and neuroscience through the lens of applied probability. So with that, uh, transitioned towards uh, the faculty position at the University of Illinois, and I got very interested in applications uh, of wedding sort of neuroscience and, uh, and applied math. And so uh, what you see right here is an application of that being a brain-machine interface, which is a system that creates a direct communication pathway between the brain and an external device. So we got interested in this because it dovetails with the applied probability work from the PhD, as well as the more recent neuroscience postdoc work. And the high-level idea is that if you can imagine someone who's a paraplegic or whatnot, who would like to still communicate or, or to navigate something despite the fact that their motor pathway, pathways might be compromised, can we accomplish that just by decoding the neural signals of their brain? So you do that by uh, putting a shower cap on their head, as you see right here. You can scrub the, uh, scrub the skin, apply conductive gel, monitor the electrical rhythms of the brain. And one of the things that we can exploit is that uh, when you're, let's say, imagining left versus imagining right, the patterns of neural activity recorded in your brain change. And so we were uh, interested in some applications of this uh, when I was at Illinois. And so one of the things that we developed was a very basic sort of classification paradigm where you take the electrical rhythms of the brain, multiple electrodes recorded on the surface of the scalp. And what you're interested in are these underlying latent dipoles, different spatial locations. And so we can develop a basic model of that reflecting the biophysics and volume conduction. And then from that, we exploit the fact that the electrical rhythms of the brain pertaining to motor commands, like imagining left or imagining right, are specific to a certain band, right? And in particular, it's called the mu rhythm. So we develop a basic statistical model of that. And then lastly, we exploit the known sort of topographic structure, meaning that when you imagine left, certain dipoles are active as compared to when you imagine right. So we integrate this together on a statistical framework and developed uh, basically an as asynchronous classifier using principles of optimal stopping time, and we were able to get a very robust classifier. And so what you see right here are conditional probabilities. This is a conditional probability that you're imagining right, and either it gets very, very small, close to zero, or very, very high and close to one. And those are the points where we do our classification asynchronously. And we could decode about 80 you know, reliable bits per minute. You know, at the, in 2010, this was the, the fastest uh, known uh, approach to do that, but that's actually not the point. The point is that the status quo when we you know, entered this field was that people thought that the brain-computer interface problem was primarily a problem of trying to just decode information from the brain. So it was unidirectional, someone imagines left or right, we record neural signals and we try to decode that. But the epiphany that we had was that, okay, that's kind of cute that you can move a ball to the left or move a ball to the right about once per minute, but we thought it was rather underwhelming. And so what we realized is that we need to think from a bigger picture perspective about the nature of a brain-computer interface, or rather any human-computer interface. And it's really this bi-directional interaction between the human and the machine. The human uh, takes a command or imagines a command. The machine processes that, but then it updates something, and it gives you feedback from which this process sequentially moves forward. And so everyone was focused on just this step, but what about the engineering of the feedback, and can we have fun with that? And so what that led to was just this epiphany of using, uh, trying to play games somewhat analogous to 20 questions, right? So if I'm playing 20 questions with you and you have a number in your head between 1 and 20, I get to ask you a question and you give me a binary response. I could ask you, is the number less than 19 or greater than 19? Is the number less than 18 or greater than 18? Sooner or later, I will hone in on the number of your head, but I will do so slowly. 
So the game I would like to play is to home in as rapidly as possible. The only issue is that here we're getting sort of your response noisily, so we only have statistical information. And so what we wanted to do was something analogous to 20 questions, but whether where that number in your head is perhaps something like a smooth path. This might be a smooth path you want to navigate your wheelchair. That's like the number between 1 and 20. And I sequentially ask you a question. Is it less than 10, greater than 10? Is it less than 5, greater than 5? But I want to do that very, very cleverly so that, these, that ultimately this path, that I'm, these questions that I'm asking you, zoom in on what's in your head. And so how do we accomplish this? Well, it turns out what's underneath the hood is some feedback information theory. And so, as I mentioned before, there's this true desired path, as specified here in green, and that's fixed. And what we do is that we basically imagine that there's a number between 0 and 1 in your head, and we translate any number between 0 and 1, as we think in the computer, in terms of a smooth path. And we do that via an arithmetic code. Okay, so as you can see right here, this path right here that banks very aggressively counterclockwise corresponds to 0. This path that goes straight, straight vertical corresponds to 1 half then likewise going very uh, clockwise corresponds to 1. So there's this language that the computer is speaking between 0 and 1, and there's a language that a human is seeing, which is paths. They're in one-to-one -one correspondence, and underneath the hood, we're actually updating our conditional distribution about the path you care about, and the key thing that we're doing cleverly is we're identifying what, what question to ask you, what path to draw. And this is optimal from an information theoretic perspective. We're, we're, we're basically zooming in. So this is the Horstein scheme from 1963 that people like Bob Gray know about. And so with that, uh, just to demonstrate another you know, example of this, we can just change the skin. We keep what's under the hood. So we overlay this on uh, Google Earth. And so here the path is in your head, and someone's really specifying this with the brain-computer interface. And I had to give a talk at Princeton, so I want to specify a path going from San Diego to Princeton, New Jersey. And so it's asking these questions, and you see the first location where they differ is about right here. And so what I do is I take a look at where they differ, and if it, I have to go in a clockwise orientation, I imagine right, otherwise I imagine left. So it's just these binary signals that are being conveyed, and sooner or later as this thing moves forward, the path is starting to zoom in more and more, and ultimately it will indeed zoom in on uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And so this is optimal from an information theoretic perspective, and although a lot of people when you zoom in from the tree's perspective, you focus on the signal processing of the one-step problem, the value proposition we're really providing is zooming out and looking from the forest and thinking about the feedback to ask. And so with that, we wanted to go one step forward to be uh, provocative and demonstrate that we could actually fly a remote-controlled airplane over the cornfields of Illinois. And so we partnered with some aerospace engineering uh, folks to do that. And uh, basically, all we're doing is we're changing the skin, but what's underneath the hood stays the same. And so here's a video of our postdoc, Ray, and he's just doing the simple path specification, as I mentioned before. Uh, and underneath the hood, there's a plane flying. It has a motion control algorithm. You can see it flying over the, the cornfields of Illinois, and it's indeed going along the path that he specified. So uh, that was interesting. And here what we ended up leveraging was uh, known results from the 1960s that had been generalized in the, uh, uh, more recently in 2011, where the idea is that if you have a, a point that's in a continuum on the 0-1 line, we can probabilistically zoom in on it very rapidly. But a very natural question that we can ask ourselves is you cannot map every problem to just a point on the 0-1 line. Uh, what happens if we want to be more general? And so, for example, uh, what if we now want to zoom in on a point on a map, right? And so that's a point in R2, right? And so suppose that there's a point here, namely Champaign, Illinois, and I would like to zoom in on that point just like how you do in Google Maps, right? And let's imagine now that you have um, one of four possible commands that you can provide. So I can maybe partition the image that I show you into four quadrants, and you let me know what quadrant it's in. I hear it through a noisy channel. So the punchline is I have a point in, in two-dimensional space, and the, the computer is sort of up updating its posterior distribution on that, and ideally it wants that posterior distribution to get very sharp. So it turns out there were no uh, sort of results for this. Uh, broadly speaking, but one thing we do know is that zooming in very rapidly, there's a fundamental speed limit of how fast we can zoom in, and that's given by the mutual information across this noisy channel. That's upper bounded by the, uh, by the capacity of this noisy channel. And what we really cared about is that uh, how can I you know, hit the speed limit exactly? That's the name of the game in information theory. And so one of the things that we know from our beloved Claude Shannon is that uh, in these sort of feedback-based systems, uh, the next piece of feedback that you provide should be statistically independent of everything we've seen so far. 
and that's really what's going on in 20 questions, right? So I want to engineer the, the sort of picture that I draw to you or the feedback that I draw such that your response is statistically independent of everything we've seen so far. So we can sort of think about this mathematically in that if we take a look at this image right here, uh, I show you some feedback. You take a look at where the point of interest is on this picture and then you just provide me, you know, for example, a quantization. What, what are these four quadrants in, in, is in? That's what this equation right here means. And then how do I go from where I was one step, one time step before, I get new EG, and how do I sort of do the effect of the zooming in? That's how I take the W from before and translate it to the new auxiliary W. And so the name of the game is how do I engineer this mapping, this transforming what was here before as to where it should be now. And it turns out that, uh, you know, this problem had not been sol uh, solved more generally, but it's uh, fundamentally re related to the theory of optimal transport that Bob Gray has done a lot of uh, uh, beautiful work in. And so just to sort of make this uh, picture point more clear, imagine that up front there's some point on this image that I care about, equally likely, and so my prior distribution is flat everywhere. Then I get some information and I update my posterior distribution. Now my posterior distribution looks like this, which means that it's more probable that the point is in this area as compared to down here. The name of the game is how do I build a map that transforms this image into this image so that this becomes a sample from that distribution. And if you notice, you notice that it's more likely the redness is in this area, and notice that I've zoomed in on this area. And so this is manifested by something called a Jacobian equation that appears in physics and whatnot, and there's all this beautiful theory from Nobel Prize winners like Kantarovich and Fields Medal winners like Villani, and we can literally just take our surfboard and ride it across the wave of all of their mathematical results, but it's specific to this information theoretic problem. And with that, uh, here's an example of what we can do. So imagine that the point of interest is this little point you know, where Shan is, Shannon is grinning, and so this is the point of, of interest that I would like to zoom in on, and remember the name of the game is that we show you a picture, you just tell us what quadrant it's in, but we hear that through a noisy channel. So at time step one, I'm going to tell you it's in the northeast quadrant, then it's going to take that, that neural data, and it's going to uh, build a new posterior distribution, and then solve this optimal transport problem, well, well defined, and redraw a new image. And if you notice when we draw the new image, notice that certain parts of, uh, of the picture are zoomed in on, and other parts are zoomed out on. And so this is mathematically optimal, we're achieving the mutual information, and you see that it has the effect that uh, we're zooming in on certain parts. And so with our postdoc uh, Ray Ma, we've sort of, you know, carefully defined all of this and given necessary and sufficient conditions under which this scheme is reliable. And what we like about this is that this application, you know, from neuroscience, motivated new math that didn't exist before. And so uh, what we like from this, the punchline is a quote from David Blackwell, uh, I'm not interested in doing research, and I never have been. I'm interested in understanding, which is quite a different thing. And often to understand something, you have to work it out yourself because no one else has done it. And so we believe that uh, if we would have started off as just being mathematical people, we never would have thought of formulating the problem this way. But because of these applications, this led to new math that needed to be developed. And so uh, that's sort of the story. Uh, for uh, so far in terms of how we were thinking at Illinois, I think it's best captured by this uh, picture that you see that appeared in The Economist, uh, sort of put your thinking cap on. Uh, things that we used to think were science fiction are fast becoming a reality. And so that's great from a sort of Steve Wozniak perspective and how we wed neuroscience and information theory to develop new math, but from a Steve Jobs perspective, this is underwhelming because of the shower cap you still have to have on your head. And so we got very interested in uh, sort of, you know, wedding medicine and analytics to do fun things like flying airplanes over the cornfields of Illinois, developing new math to do it in more general dimensions. But the types of paintings we could generate were limited. So what we had to do is get out of our comfort zone and work on things that we didn't have that much experience doing, namely building uh, better sensors, unobtrusive sensors. And by wedding these three together, perhaps we can build better paintings. And so uh, this led to us basically wanting to develop uh, electronic sensors that are uh, bio-integrated, right? And what makes that challenging is that biology is soft, curvy, linear, and elastic, whereas electronic circuits are built with semiconductor wafers, which are rigid, planar, and brittle. So there's this fundamental disconnect like Democrats and Republicans, right? And so uh, what we were able to do, though, is to have this epiphany in working with material scientists that you can take a uh, semiconductor wafer, which is primarily acting as a skillet, when you cook food, meaning that it serves no functional role in eating, but it serves a role in the cooking process. 
namely when you're fabricating electronic circuits and you have temperatures and chemicals, it can withstand all those variations, but ultimately the functional electronics are very, very thin at just the top uh, layer of your, of your semiconductor wafer. Can we peel those off, integrate them onto something naturally bendable, right, and ultimately have our tortilla with food inside of it and make this more bio-integrated, so to speak. And so we, were, we worked uh, closely with John Rogers, a material scientist at Illinois, and we're able to accomplish these systems that we call epidermal electronics. And so these are flexible electronic systems that are bio-integrated, and we can do clever things and be provocative, you know, hint, hint, and uh, uh, basically integrate these uh, onto the skin via the application of a temporary tattoo. So these are sometimes also called tattoo electronics. <clears throat> here's a blow-up picture of the device, and what you can see right here is that there's lots of squiggly lines everywhere. Right, and so you see that there's, uh, uh, we, we can build antennas out of these. All the electrical connections are done with squiggly lines that are analogous to the box springs in your bed that can accommodate mechanical deformations and bend with the skin. We can throw LEDs and light sensors on there, power these things wirelessly, integrate small batteries, monitor electrophysiology. So one of the interesting things here is that uh, when you have to be bio-integrated when you're wedding electronics with biology, things that you just think as a, as a double E don't necessarily apply. We would not be thinking about the importance of having these serpentine-like structures to accommodate mechanical deformations. And so we demonstrated in 2011 that we can do a variety of things like monitor the electrical rhythms of the heart, monitor skin temperature, monitor one of the things we love, the electrical rhythms of the brain, the EEG. Uh, but what we got interested in doing is going one step further when I got to UCSD in that we wanted to uh, uh, collaborate with clinicians. And so our postdoc, uh, Sheila Rosenberg, has worked with us to partner with the Department of Reproductive Medicine and basically take this out of the lab and really do this in a clinical context. And so one of the things we got interested in, for example, is pregnancy monitoring, where you have to wear those clunky, uh, those clunky belts and you're trying to monitor the physiology of the mom as well as of the, of the fetus. What if we can uh, take the conventional electrodes during pregnancy and simultaneously put these flexible electrodes? Let's do a validation study and see, can we monitor things such as the fetal heart rate. Uh, in red represents what's done with the conventional clunky technology. The blue is what we estimate with our epidermal sensors. And then secondly, uh, what about the, uh, the uterine contractions? And the uterine contractions here is what's con uh, recorded with the conventional belt. And what you see here in blue is what's recorded with the epidermal sensors. Punchline being that when one is small, the other is small. When one is big, the other is big. The, the high level theme of where we would like to go to this is to imagine that in many parts of the developing world, um, there's more smartphones than there is running water. And so could, could we imagine that we could replace this picture on the left, which is done primarily in the developed world, with this picture on the right, which we can now begin to imagine also doing uh, uh, in the developing world. And so this leads to a bigger picture interest of our research group at UCSD is imagining bio-integrated electronics that we develop or others that can perhaps wirelessly transmit information to your smartphone or your smartwatch we can understand, uh, uh, so extract meaning out of this physiological data and build decision support tools to give to the user and or pass the information on to a clinician so they can intervene when appropriately. And so I'd be lying to you if I told you that everything worked beautifully. There are challenges, uh, some of which uh, involve uh, doing validation studies, as I mentioned before, and really verifying that these new sensors can pick up commensurate information with conventional technology. Another big challenge is energy. Although the electronic circuits get smaller and smaller, the same cannot be said about energy density. And so we have to build very energy aware applications. Uh, the unintended consequences of being bio-integrated uh, are somewhat obvious in retrospect, but if you want to build something that's flexible that can accommodate mechanical deformations, the resonant frequency of your antenna can change, piss off the FCC. And so, for example, if we stretch this by just 12%, the resonant frequency of the antenna changes by 27%. Uh, there's also qualitative issues related to security and privacy. And also, when we extract all this statistical meaning out of this data, uh, how do we present it to a doctor in a succinct manner from which they can make appropriate decisions? So we're actively working on a variety of these things and building antennas based on the designs of fractals and developing new communication schemes, but I won't go into that for the purpose of time. Uh, but rather, I'll, I'll uh, sort of you know, focus a little bit on sort of what new analytics applications uh, have arisen in light of these types of uh, uh, broad uh, uh, applications that we're thinking of. One of them is this issue of uh, trying to extract uh, meaning out of data. And so uh, what we learned is that uh, physicians are really good statisticians when there's not that much data. And so what I mean is that if you take a look at these doctors that are monitoring these, uh, these pregnant moms, 
they might take a look at the uterine contractions and the fetal heart rate. So imagine these are two time series. And they determine that if they see a massive uterine contraction, which is this blue signal, right? Uh, there's a signal B, and they, they take a look at if the past of the uterine contraction in the future gives rise to an abrupt change in the fetal heart rate, in particular a deceleration, that's suggestive of uh, fetal distress, that the baby might not be able to withstand a natural childbirth, so they intervene and do a C-section. So they, they think about this, and they're basically painting a mental picture that the past of this process is affecting the future of this in a manner that's uh, uh, harmful, potentially, to the neonate. So that's great when there's just, you know, a couple of time series. But what happens in the future when with wearable sensors, we've got a bunch of wearables all over our body. And we want to be able to monitor sort of these different organs and how their physiological processes are covariant with each other to intervene. Can we all do that mentally? Probably not. So this gives rise to the interest in trying to think about multimodal time series analysis that provides succinct pictures from which humans can make decisions. And if you notice, one of these things that's appropriate right here, it's not just correlation, but really how the past of one time series is covariant with the future of another, which is a question of causation. And, you know, we wanted to do this in a fundamental way, you know, in the spirit of Shannon, so that we can nail problems related to biological processes. But while we're at it, what if we could also analyze financial time series or user behavior in social networks, right? And we're not the only people thinking about this. There's a company called Clout, K-L-O-U-T, that you know, is about to be acquired for $100 million. And they're basically trying to understand causal relationships as it relates to people's behavior in social networks to better serve ads to them. So how do we think about this, this process uh, if we focus now on, say, physiological data, but using a framework that's broadly applicable? So we want to build pictures that reflect sort of uh, not just correlation, but questions of causation. And so, you know, what I always say is uh, walk on the shoulder of giants. We walked on the shoulder of Shannon before. Well, who's thought about causality in a statistical sense in the past? Well, uh, a Nobel laureate named Clive Granger uh, in economics has thought about this. And so he developed this notion of, of causality way back in the late 1960s. And the high-level idea is this. Imagine I've got these three time series, X, Y, and Z. And I want to understand, ask the question, is X causally influencing, let's say, Y? And I have, you know, observations of all of these. What I find remarkable is that I always read the classical papers and read what they said in English, right? And so what I love what he said in English is that, you know, I say that X is causing Y in a statistical sense. If I'm better able to predict the future of Y using all past information as compared to predicting the future of Y using all information excluding X. So what that means at a high level is that I'm trying to uh, imagine the past of, of all the time series, right? And I want to build a you know, predictor of the future of Y. Well, I can think building some very simple linear autoregressive predictor. I want to understand the quality of these errors right here when I use a, a least, you know, least squares uh, sort of fit with these coefficients. Now, in parallel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build another predictor that uses the past of all information excluding x. And that's this equation here on the left, right? I'm trying to build, predict the future of y using the past of everything excluding x. Again, let's say a linear predictor. This is how Granger thought about it. And the high-level idea is that you have to understand, uh, is the right better than the left in its predictive capability? If so, that means x is causing y, because when I exclude it, my performance goes down. So one way you can think about that is just look at the, you know, basically the variability in these errors as compared to these. And are they uh, near 1, or is their log near 0? And so that's great if you have time series where linear autoregressive prediction makes sense. But what if you have time series that relates to maybe the times at which fetal decelerations occur, right? Or the times at which uterine contractions occur. So if you think about this, these are basically binary time series. In this moment, was there contraction, yes or no? And so if this is binary, the right-hand side here is a real number, but the left-hand side is binary. So the punchline is that the mathematization, in some sense, does not apply to all modalities. But can we be faithful to Clive Granger and really embody what he said in English in his original sentence but develop mathematics that applies more generally. And so, uh, so we can apply to any modality. And so us as information theorists or any statistician, we know that when we think prediction, right, we don't think specifying one number, right? You know, if I'm betting on whether or not, uh, you know, Germany is going to beat Argentina, uh, the Vegas odds predictors don't say, yes, Germany is going to win or yes, Argentina is going to win. They give you odds. So a prediction fundamentally should be a probability measure, right? And so we know this, and so we can think about building two predictors of the future of Y, one that's given the past of everything, and another given the past of everything excluding X. So prediction is a belief, and then we have to quantify a notion of better, 
And so we use our beloved log loss, the Shannon loss in information theory and statistics that has a long history of being a good measure of performance. And then all we do is we compare the two predictors. I compare one predictor that has the pass of everything to a predictor that has the pass of everything excluding x. Well, under the log loss, we get this log likelihood ratio. On average, this becomes a directed information. And so this is an information measure that's non-negative, and it's zero if and only if a conditional independence uh, uh, holds. And what's nice about this is this is applicable to any modality. So these could be point processes, this could be any type of modality. And so we've developed this and applied this in a variety of different applications in collaboration with Nagar Kiyavash at Illinois. Uh, but the punchline that we came to realize is that if you notice right here, we've got to calculate these conditional probabilities. And in general, that's not easy to do, right? And so the question becomes, how do we go about calculating these conditional probabilities? And one of the things that a lot of us know is that in general, you have to think about doing things like Bayes' rule. And so a conditional probability, let's say a posterior distribution of x given y, can be thought of as a, as a likelihood, p of y given x, times a prior p of x uh, divided by a normalization constant. And in many situations, you guys know that normalization constants don't matter, right? They don't, they don't affect the shape of things, right? But remember that we're looking at log likelihood ratios, so that normalization constant really matters. And so um, we have to stand back and think about how are people typically thinking about this? And the way people are typically thinking about this is uh, in a lot of the machine learning community, people like Google and LinkedIn, when they're developing their, their highly scalable algorithms, they don't really care about the denominator, right? What they typically do is they just uh, look at point estimates, right, where they take a look at maybe the posterior distribution and at what point is it maximal. Uh, but that can be challenging because, or that, that can be misleading, rather, because if you notice this blue curve and this green curve, they both have the same maximizer, this red dot right here. But the, the shape of this blue curve is more wide than the shape of this green curve. And so when we're calculating decisions and our normalization constants, those two things are different. And so what we got interested in doing, and this is work uh, with uh, grad student Diego Mesa, postdoc Ray Ma, as well as our postdoc Sang Yoon Kim, is developing algorithms that can extract this normalization constant and quantify the whole shape of the posterior, but in a manner that's scalable that can ride the momentum of uh, all the work that uh, you know, Google and everyone else has done with their cloud infrastructure. Okay, and this can be applicable to many things, multiple physiological modalities, you know, motivated by these new wearable sensors. And, uh, but there's a challenge. If we take a look at the literature and what people have done, if you ever want to actually, you know, actually calculate the whole blue curve and get the normalization constant, you have to use these algorithms typically called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And not to go into the details, but these things are complicated, they're context specific. If your prior and your likelihood changes, you have to build a new, you know, time, in, uh, time reversible Markov chain whose invariant distribution is the posterior. Some of you guys know this very well. It inherently is not sort of scalable. And so we want to think about this problem differently. And it turns out that the exact same mathematics that we discussed before applies in an inverse fashion. So it turns out within the context of Bayesian inference, if we can build a map that can transform a sample from the prior to a sample from the posterior, it turns out that there's a beautiful variational equation that, get, that we get the normalization constant for free without needing to do that high dimensional integral. So again, uh, optimal maps in the theory of optimal transport plays a role. And so what we've done is we've gone one step further and demonstrated that for a large class of prior and likelihood models, things that are quote unquote log concave, all the you know, generalized linear models, exponential families, you know, sparse Laplacian priors, all the things that people are currently doing in machine learning fall within this class. What we show is that this problem of finding a map to, 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 to transform a sample from the prior to a sample from the posterior can be solved via a KL divergence minimization approach, but more importantly, it gets transformed to an optimization approach that is convex. So, and not only is it convex, but it can be solved in a distributed manner. So a lot of us know that convex convexity means easily solvable, but uh, moreover, it can be solved resting upon the infrastructure of things like Hadoop and MapReduce that Google use. And so we recently demonstrated this in a paper in the Proceedings of the IEEE, and uh, what's, uh, uh, and that's sort of the, primarily the work of Diego. And on the other hand, what we're you know, sort of flirting with in our minds is that if we think about the future of these wearables, they're going to be recording all these physiological processes. We don't necessarily want to digitize all that data and dump it to the cloud and let the cloud do the analysis. These distributed scalable algorithms, could they actually be done in circuits 
locally right on your wearable. And that's the subject of Marcella Mendoza's PhD thesis, and it turns out for a large class of likelihood models, the answer is yes, and we can build analog circuits, very small, low energy to do that. And so the high level idea is that I, I accord all this data across these multiple modalities, but rather than digitizing all that and paying the energy cost of dumping it, dumping it across the wireless link, we pre-process the data locally using distributed circuits that can be embedded right in your wearable. And so that's the focus of what Marcella has done. And ultimately, you get the full posterior distribution, which is useful for a variety of decision-making tasks. So this is you know, one of the themes about the analytics motivated by the application that arises. So hopefully what you guys see from what we're doing is that a lot of our analytics applications don't come in a vacuum, but it's really the applications that are motivating their development. So, so you know, moving forward with this picture, the last thing I can share with you about is some things that we're doing within the context of uh, clinical applications. Uh, this is a uh, joint work with uh, postdoc Sheila Rosenberg sitting in the audience and Radu Sina, who's uh, not here, who's uh, uh, doing an internship right now. And also, here's our beloved friend Hachi, her, her pet. And so, uh, I've already told you a little bit about the pregnancy monitoring, and now I want to tell you about another application as it relates to also the early stages of life. And so one of the things that we're learning from interacting with clinicians is that there's this notion of trickle-down medicine and trickle-down technology. Uh, in that, many practices of medicine and uses of technology in medicine were really optimized for adults. And then all people do is they take a subset of that that works for children, and they use it there. And they take a subset of that that works for newborn babies, and they use it there. Both a clinical application as well as the use of technology. It's not that often that practices of medicine or technology are optimized for arguably our most vulnerable patient population. And so we stumbled across a collaboration with uh, uh, an MD, MJ Harbert, who's a, um, you know, a, a neonatal neurologist here at UCSD in Rady Children's Hospital. And what's uh, very interesting about her is that uh, so she, she's from Seattle. She has this monotone voice, but she, she sometimes drops bombs with the things that she's saying. And I found it just, you know, it's one of these things about what did they say in English and really sit back and take a deep breath and digest that. So in our conversations with her early, one of the things that was mind blowing is when she kept emphasizing that the physiology of the newborn baby is very different than that of any other human, let alone, you know, an adult, let alone a three-year-old child. And so the implications of that are broad because there's many practices of medicine that they've trained doctors on to treat children that really come from the mindset of thinking about treating adults. And the implications can be, uh, uh, can be daunting, right? And so, um, for example, there's over 1,500 doctors in the U.S. alone that treat brain injury in adults for things like stroke and whatnot. There's only 30 doctors in the world that do this for newborn babies, okay? Moreover, the idea about what to treat, what type of intervention to apply, really comes from the mindset of thinking about adults. Uh, but the reverse sometimes can happen. And so newborn babies, for example, um, the excitatory connections in their brain form before the inhibitory ones do. And so if we get a baby that's born with a brain injury, uh, the inhibitory connections between uh, their, their neural cells might not be formed. And if we think about any of us and know anything about control engineering, if we don't have negative feedback, right, the implications can be instability. And so lo and behold, a lot of newborn babies that have brain injury have seizures. And so, um, uh, so MJ has to think about providing interventions that are unique to uh, looking at the fact that these uh, inhibitory connections are not there and using the right forms of, uh, you know, the right forms of drugs to use for this, anticonvulsant drugs. And the reason this is so important is because a lot of these baby seizures are subclinical, meaning that if there's no overt uh, sort of behavioral way that you can determine that they're having a seizure, you need to be recording the electrical rhythms of the brain. Babies that are born prematurely, 10% of all babies born, are, are much more prone to have these seizures. They go untreated, it can lead to cognitive impairment, uh, long-term epilepsy, sometimes even death. So she needs to aggressively treat these seizures, either with drugs or with hypothermia, cooling down the core body temperature of the baby to reduce inflammation, very much like when you put the ice pack on your knee after you have an injury. Uh, the issue though is that if you take a look at this picture right here, this baby doesn't look happy. This baby is not comfortable, and the reason that baby is not comfortable is because they have to use the, the same process of scrubbing the skin, applying the conductive gel, putting the shower cap on their head. But we have to remember that the, the, the babies have very fragile skin, especially a premature baby. And that process of scrubbing the skin can damage it, can even lead to abscess inflammation, sometimes even death. So you see there's this unmet need to be continuously monitoring the baby, but in a manner that is unobtrusive to the skin. Lo and behold, 
Let's think about the epidermal sensors. So we are doing validation studies in the hospital right now, and here's a picture of one of these babies where we have the conventional sensors on the body as well as the new epidermal sensors. And so there's two things that we want to do, first of which is compare the, the signals from the epidermal as compared to conventional, but we also want to compare the effect that they have on the skin. So here's a picture of one of the premature babies that we dealt with. And so uh, here is, uh, you know, after the, the, you know, the conventional electrodes where we had to scrub the skin, you can see here's where the glue that remained, the epidermal sensor is still here, there. And then here is a, a picture after we removed the epidermal sensor, and you know, the, the, the imaging is not the best here, but there's a little bit of redness in these areas where the conventional sensor was where we had to scrub the skin, and there's not nearly as much where the epidermal sensor is. So we don't have data with that many babies. We don't want to get too excited, but the punchline right here is that this is one potential use case of this technology that could really benefit people clinically. And so just to emphasize, this is the, you know, the high level theme of many things that we're doing in our research group, unobtrusive technology, thinking about the analytics, performance, energy aware, and ultimately thinking about applications that can benefit lives clinically. Uh, what I wanted to do with the rest of my time is flirt with you with some of the other crazy things that we're doing in our lab. Uh, and so the title of our lab is the Neural Interaction Laboratory. And one of the things that we're very interested in is the interaction between humans and machines, such as brain machine interfaces or a human and a wearable, a human and their smartwatch, but also uh, fundamental questions in social neuroscience involving the interaction between multiple humans or multiple animals. This is sort of a new emerging area in neuroscience where we think certain quantitative approaches could really benefit the understanding. And so uh, Ray Ma and our philosopher postdoc here, Marcelo Aguilar Rivera, I love that picture of him, looking like a philosopher, uh, we're working on some applications involving uh, uh, sort of this, this question of the neural basis of, uh, of social interaction. And so some of the things that we do is we've got, uh, we're lucky to have rats in the basement of this building and we can put multi-electrode arrays into their brain and we can develop paradigms where we can monitor uh, their neural processes while they're awake behaving in sort of normal environments, uh, minimally tethered or untethered. And so what you see right here is one of these rats and we put a multi-electrode array uh, inside of their, their cortex and we're recording their, uh, their neural spike trains and it's wirelessly transmitting uh, to a system, right? And so here's a, one of these multi-electrode arrays wirelessly transmitting and here are the different cells that we can pick up and there's a variety of interesting questions that we're asking and one of these is a uh, sort of uh, joint work uh, so this is Marcelo's project this is joint work with Professor Andrew Chiba who's going to speak to you and so what you see right here is here's one of, one of our rats and you can see here's the little uh, multi-electrode array wirelessly transmitting uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, these electrical signals and we're monitoring a certain area of the brain called the insular cortex and this is known to be implicated in interoception of the sense of self but also it's implicated in questions of empathy. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want to um, basically have one rat and we want to see what happens when his buddy that he mates or that he hangs out with, right, he knows his smell, what if his buddy is trapped? And so you see right here we put his buddy in this little cage and this guy is trapped and we want to understand uh, how long is it going to take or what, what is the processes for which he will try to uh, sort of open this lever to let his buddy get out. And if you think about this, he gets no direct benefit by letting his buddy get out. So this relates to one of the questions of empathy and whatnot. And we want to understand uh, the neural basis of this as he goes through this process and what feeling of, you know, uh, of, of, of goodness does he get in the process of letting his buddy out. And so you see, he, he figured out how to press the lever, his buddy got out, and now he's trying to hang out in the, uh, uh, in the little cage with him. So it's just some of these interesting new questions in social neuroscience, interaction between multiple people and their behavior, as well as monitoring the neural processes of what's going on. So that's one high level, you know, crazy project that we're working on. And another high level project that we're working on is, you know, we have to always ask ourselves, right? I was at Illinois, you know, John Rogers is there, you know, one of the godfathers of flexible electronics. Well, hey, now we're at UCSD, we got Nobel Prize winners that have developed all sorts of approaches that can sort of, you know, take light and intersect it with biology to do fun things. So when we got here at UCSD, we start to scratch our heads and say, well, hey, what can we do that sort of involves uh, the intersection between light and biology to have fun? So here's a picture of some of these flexible electronics that we can develop. Although I primarily told you about integration onto the skin, if you think about it, these are flexible, we can integ integrate them into any biologically inert elastomer, so we can make these things implantable, and we can put LEDs on these things, as I mentioned before. And so, um, you know, the Nobel Prize uh, winner, uh, Roger Chen, who developed GFP, green, green fluorescent protein, is here. 
and more generally, there's so much interesting stuff going on at UCSD at the intersection of light and biology. So we want to take our surfboard and arrive it over that wave of, of innovation. And so uh, a couple of grad students, the incoming grad student, Nicole Hoffner and Mary Annie Catano, uh, who's supported by CSOI, have been working on a project to go uh, to sort of think about, um, and a lot of these neuroscience questions that we want to ask, such as the stuff I just showed you with Marcelo, we might want to sort of, uh, you know, let, let's say block uh, one specific gene that we know relates to uh, uh, certain proteins implicated in, you know, brain functions that relates to empathy or whatnot. And we might want to do this in a very precise, controlled manner. We want to, more broadly speaking, understand how uh, a lot of these different neural processes by controlling uh, 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 physiological function. So other people, as you may know, have developed optogenetics that with light can control when and on neuron fires. We were interested in going one step further and actually controlling gene expression itself. And so uh, it turns out there's some ways that you can do that. And so this is in collaboration with Gentry Patrick here. And what you see in this picture right here is a, is a human cell. And we've genetically engineered it uh, so that when you hit it with one wavelength of light, he's not expressing this gene and now he is. And so you can see this sort of green color uh, not, uh, near the extracellular space uh, of the cell. And then we hit it with another uh, wavelength of light and it stops. And so Nicole and Mary Annie are working on a lot of mathematical modeling of this to not only get this to work, but to optimize it, to optimize its dynamics so it's relevant to the neuroscience applications that we care about. But broadly speaking, why this is kind of cool is because think about the flexible electronics that are, that are being developed as well. We could imagine integrating the flexible electronics right into tissue and developing a variety of in vivo applications where we can sort of interrogate these things in real time. And so, and then going one step even further, you know, if gene therapy ever takes off, this could have implications even in humans. So this is the high level picture that we're interested in, but there's a lot of uh, careful mathematical modeling that still needs to be done so we can really optimize the dynamics of this. And what we think is interesting about this is that this is a whole never, whole other level of what you call brain IO, all the way down at the level of controlling genes optically. So this is another high level project that we're working on and, uh, and, and we see how you know, a variety of these things sort of come together. And so what I would like to do uh, and sort of concluding is uh, thanking a lot of our partners who supported us uh, financially and with in-kind support. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of you know, people that are developing wearables and thinking about embedded electronics. So we're very thankful to MC10, co-founded by our collaborator John Rogers, of Illinois. As you can imagine, Intel is very interested in the, the applications, the energy aware aspects of this. And so they donated a variety of things to us. Uh, we're thankful to both Google and Amazon Web Services who've given us free access to their cloud infrastructure so that we can build our algorithms uh, and run them on the cloud infrastructure to really tase out a lot of those details. And also we're very excited about uh, the clinical applications taking place, including at the UC San Diego New Jacobs Medical Center. Uh, we used to have these philosophical discussions in our lab about uh, imagine if one day Google were to build a hospital. Imagine all the fun analytics that you could do to predict things and understand or how these things co-vary. Well, Erwin Jacobs, who some of you may know of, is the godfather of wireless, co-founder of Qualcomm, uh, basically is bankrolling a billion dollar hospital that we have here in San Diego that's being erected that you can see with the construction. And as you can imagine, he's a big believer in technology and its integration with medicine. So these high level, you know, sort of mental flirtations we would have with ourselves, we can now instantiate in 2016 when this hospital opens. Lastly, we'd like to thank, obviously, NSF, uh, Center for Science of Information, NIH, DOD, Gerber Foundation, and the Hartwell Foundation for the baby work, Gates Foundation for the pregnancy work, and the Cavley Foundation for the crazy far out stuff that we're doing with Mary Annie and Nicole. And uh, just to sort of conclude, for some of the students in the audience, you know, going all the way back full circle, you know, we went along this path of trying to build WED, you know, sort of originally, the expertise in analytics from the PhD, the postdoc uh, connection with medicine, and then really going out of our comfort zone and partnering with others to develop new innovations with sensors so that we can wed these together and develop, uh, you know, interesting applications to benefit lives. Uh, but you know, I just want to be very careful here because a lot of people get starstruck by these, you know, silly little sensors that we make. And what I tell the students all the time in our lab is that each one of these little things is just a paintbrush. That's all it is. It's a paintbrush. We are painters and we have to think about what painting we want to make. And these paint brushes are only as useful as the paintings that we want to draw. And what I mean by that, moreover, is that if you take Pablo Picasso and you give him three dull paint brushes, he's still going to paint a masterpiece. If you give an amateur three of the most sophisticated paint brushes in the world, 
most likely their painting is still going to be nonsense. So let's not get overly, you know, infatuated with the paint brushes. Let's remember what we want to paint and only use sophisticated paint brushes when necessary. It's a takeaway lesson what I tell everyone in our lab all the time. Speaking of our lab, you know, here's a picture of everyone uh, who does all the work and I try to sort of acknowledge everyone in each part of the presentation and what their contribution was. And so uh, with that, that's the high level story of uh, uh, what our research group is doing and snippets of the things that we talked about you'll see in uh, the demos that we provide. We're going to have a, a real brain computer interface application running so you can see that application we showed. We'll show you the lab, we'll show you where we do the flexible electronics and the high-level rig where we do the experiments with the rats. And so any of you who go to the, uh, the lab tour will get a chance to see that. And so uh, that's the high-level story. And I can uh, perhaps take a question or two if anyone uh, 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 is, is interested in asking. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I had a question about, so back to the, the optimal maps and the mapping of a smooth Yes. The, the mapping. Yes. So, I heard about this a uh, long time ago, this kind of word input device in one day, like the dash art. Where you yes. Can, so, so I was trying to understand if what you were describing. Does it doesn't relate to dash? Yeah, yeah is it a okay. sequence, a, like a discrete it's, sequence of left, right, or is it going to take a stream of left, right commands? Uh, it's, it's a sequential process. So, uh, you know, if you like, I can. Uh, Someone here can be the gatekeeper on time. I think we're doing well with time. Uh, uh, but just very fast, let me show you uh, this picture. Where is this picture? Am I going crazy? Um, I can't find this picture. Oh, here it is. Um, OK, so first of all, you had a question about Dasher. So uh, what's interesting about Dasher is that Dasher has an information theoretic perspective but it's primarily data compression. It's not thinking about correction of errors. So is anyone here familiar with Dasher? It was developed by this guy named David McKay out in the UK. It's basically this new, it's thinking about new human, human computer interface, right? So imagine that you can kind of scroll your mouse around to ultimately complete the sentence that you want to, that you want to type. So imagine you have A, B, C, D, you scroll, your, you scroll your mouse within T, then T zooms in, and then there's A, B, C, D again, so to go to T, H, and then you go into the E to get to T, H, E. And so what he is doing that's somewhat similar to what we're doing is that the, 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 the width of uh, t, of, of the interval uh, corresponding to t, corresponds to the probability of t. And then inside of h corresponds to the probability of h given t, going to the th. And so really what he's doing is data compression. He's building a, he's building a sort of, sort of so any, any sentence is really a point on the 0, 1 line. Uh, but this is very, very efficient, right? Because as we all know, the lengths of intervals should, should correspond to their associated probabilities. And so what he's in some sense doing is a version of an arithmetic code, as I'm talking about here. But we're doing one step more than that. We're, we, we know that what we hear from you is not exactly what you said, but it's a noisy reflection of it. It's almost as if someone was using Dasher, but they were drunk, right? And so they, they don't always move their, because we're hearing neural signals, which are a noisy reflection of what they said. So what we do is when we redraw, imagine, you know, you know infinitesimally at every millisecond, we redraw an image. And that image is taken into consideration that what we heard was noisy. And so we're almost like, you know, Dasher is sort of this, but what we're doing is that we're redrawing things, taking into consideration the fact that what we heard is, is you know, is a noisy version of what you said because we're picking up neural signals. So that, does that address sort of your, your high level question, I believe? Great. So it's related to Dasher. In some sense, this is Dasher, but we're on top of that with the feedback because of the noise. Neural signals are a noisy reflection of what you're imagining. And that's where all the feedback information theory comes in. <clears throat> uh, uh, any, uh, any other high level questions? Yes, sir. We'll take one more. And also remember that you guys can ask me more questions during the lab tour, et cetera. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask uh, if you could give any example of uh, how you were talking about uh, controlling gene expression optics. Yes. If there was any high level example of how uh, how that is achieved. Right, so there, there's no, so, so basically a lot of these results about the interaction between light and biology come from plant biology because, you know, photosynthesis, right? You take light and you control energy production and whatnot. So there's a variety, there's three, you know, we, 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 we can't stop counting. There's a variety of different approaches for which you can, um, there's a variety of different approaches for which you can use light 
uh, to control gene expression. And at a very high level, you have certain proteins that uh, come together or go apart uh, uh, depending upon uh, uh, when, when light is present. So basically, you know, if you think about some of the, uh, the quantum mechanics underlying band gap and whatnot and the presence of light, right? And so what happens is there's some, you know, the proteins have an affinity to want to come together or not. You know, there's some thermodynamic stuff going on. So this happens in plant biology all the time. What you can do is you can take some of those known proteins where that happens and then couple it to transcription. And so there's a variety of approaches to do this. Uh, uh, people do it, people have chemically controlled approaches uh, to, get, you know, to get things to come together. You can use light, et cetera. We, we're not so much interested in, uh, we, we picked one of those, for example. We were interested in the application of it for these neuroscience studies. And then, what we, again, the application motivates the math. What we came to realize is that there's a lot of unmet need in quantitatively thinking about this exactly so that you can really optimize the dynamics for the specific physiological scenario that you care about. But where we're starting from is we're exploiting known stuff in plant biology that other people have developed. Um, 